So what I want to talk about is basically um, the way that cyber has been evolving after the last few years, because I think it's actually very, very interesting what's happening right now. And I don't think enough people are sort of taking a, a broader look at what's actually happening inside the industry. So what I'm going to be talking about is sort of how uh, the job that we do has changed over the last 15 years that I've been involved in it, and uh, where I think that's going. And so I guess the first thing to bring up is that I've been involved in this for a very long time, uh, since the 90s. And uh, over those years, there has been quite a lot of changes in um, just the, the way that things operate. And like, I'm not sure how many of you have been involved for as long as me, like Thomas I think is longer, but um, I think if, if anyone's been around over the last five years, you will have seen that there's been a significant change in what's happened, and um, you know, you, you probably, I guess most of you are too young for this, but you, you don't remember what it was like back in the day. Like, it was basically awesome. Um, we hacked everything. Uh, we basically got to um, roll on the internet, hack anything we liked. Uh, no one could catch us because no one had any skills. Like, the, the internet was ours. Uh, and then we got jobs, <laughs> but you know, for for a while it was actually quite a lot of fun. Pretty much the only people there were us. There was only hackers out there. Um, so at the time, what we were doing was very very simple, right? You, you'd find Ode, you'd hack everything, and then you'd find more Ode, right? And and that was the job. It was great. Um, so this is what the game used to be. It used to just be about hacking stuff, and it used to be very, very simple because there was no one doing it but other hackers. And there wasn't that much in it, right? Like the point of hacking was literally just to hack more, right? You'd, you'd hack a box, and then you'd use that box to scan, and then you'd hack those boxes, and you'd use those boxes to scan, and then you would hack those boxes, and you would use those boxes to scan, and then eventually you'd get very tired of this, and then you'd find a new bug, and then you'd start all over again. We could hack a new batch of boxes. So it, it wasn't actually purposeful. Right? We, we were doing it because it was just fun in and of itself. And then we kind of grew up a bit and we got jobs. And there were a few jobs that you could get that you'd sort of fall into uh, in different categories. And sort of the main one would be you would do security for a company, like Citigroup or another financial company. And if you were doing security for a company, um, basically, your corporate job was cleaning up after script kiddies, like people like us that used to just hack stuff. So you clean up after people that hacked you by accident because they happened to find a box that was vulnerable. You'd clean up malware because malware was just everywhere. Most of it wasn't particularly malicious, and then uh, the criminals got more involved as there was more money. So then you had to be more worried about criminal malware, but it was still very, very basic stuff. It wasn't that interesting. Um, Maybe you got a job at a cert, and then your job was uh, coordinating vulnerability disclosures, which you know fortunately has now been solved, and no one needs to do that anymore. Um, maybe you got a job at a very, very large security company, such as Kaspersky, and then your job was basically coordinating security vulnerabilities, cleaning up malware, and looking for script kiddies. But you know, that was it, that was all of your job. Uh, or if you were extremely lucky, you worked at a dedicated security company that did only security research, or was able to afford people who did security research. Uh, EI was one of them early on. So th those were sort of your choices, and all of them were very, very basic and kind of boring, right? You were, you were looking for script kiddies, you were dealing with malware, like you were dealing with bugs. This was the game, right? Cleaning up after breaches, cleaning up malware, and cleaning up broken code. You, you were basically an internet janitor. It was not very exciting. I mean, it, it was challenging, but that was it. And then one day, the game got weird. Right. So this was about 2010, uh, when all of a sudden, we started seeing um, more and more APT stuff started showing up. Right. And in about 2011, Stuxnet showed up, and everyone went, holy shit, 
Like, it's, it's not just kidding. It's like there's actual hackers out there that actually matter. And the main thing here was that the game got very big. Right? It went from this very, very small, insular world of only caring about uh, breaches to your company, uh, breaches in your home network, uh, malware that would affect your family or your customers. It was now global. Like, there were nations that were involved in security. Like, it was really, really big. And that's because we became involved in the great game. So the thing about the great game is the great game is basically the espionage and intelligence world um, where all of the nations that matter, basically, are fighting each other to get information, uh, to steal data from each other, and to figure out what's going on. So this, like, it, when it got big, it got great. And that's been a very, very weird thing. Right? If, you, if you joined security 10 years ago, your job was cleaning up stuff. And now your job is fighting the KGB, which is not necessarily what you signed up for. Right? Uh, this is uh, Jiantong University, which is the uh, Shanghai Research University, which is one of the feeder schools for one of the main uh, PLA groups. So allegedly one of the feeder schools for allegedly one of the main PLA groups that is allegedly behind the ABT campaigns. Um, and I've asked uh, Captain Howe to get me memorabilia from here, and he was a dick and he didn't do it. But uh, if anyone goes to this school and is here, I'd like to talk to you. No? <laughs> Chalky raises his hand. <laughs> <laughs> He's an adjunct professor. <laughs> but you know, like it's not just the Chinese. Like if, if you read if you read all the stuff on the internet that everyone talks about, you'd think that the Asia Pacific threat is exclusively a Chinese phenomenon. And it's not. Right? Like the Chinese are not the only people hacking people, they're the only people that everyone feels it's safe to call out. Right? You, you can say, look, we found like this malware and it came from China, and what's China going to do? Nothing, right? It's perfectly safe. You can call out China as much as you like. If you call out the DTSE, they might fucking kill you. <laughs> like, they're actually assholes. Um, so, these, these are another huge one. These guys are almost as good as the NSA, right? Uh, this is Lubyanka, that's where the FSB, uh, formerly the KGB. This is where they're located. Um, they have a very, very interesting model. It's not exactly the same as the Chinese. The Chinese one, their approach to security is that they give very, very broad directives. Like, from now on, we want stealth technology. Right? And then that will trickle down to a fusion center, and a fusion center will liaise with the private sector and say, in order to do stealth technology, what technologies do we need? And then the private sector will say, well, we need this, that, and the other and these companies in America are working on it. They'll put that back into the Fusion Center. The Fusion Center will then contact the PLA and say, uh, hit these companies and get all the shit that they have. The PLA will then uh, send that out. They'll get their teams to do it. They'll bring all the data back. It gets translated. Um, so there's actually two universities in Shanghai that are involved. One is the Research University, and the other one is the University of Foreign Languages, because you need a huge amount of analysts to translate all this stuff. So they pull all the data back in, it goes into the Fusion Center, and then the Fusion Center kind of washes it and gives it out to the private sector. And it's very, very efficient. Like the US, if they had thought of this, they would be doing it as well. Right? Like it's actually the best possible way of using data from like all the other companies you can find. It's, it's genius. Um, and the US has nothing like it, which is one of the reasons they don't do economic espionage, because they have no way of getting that data out. And the Chinese solve that problem, it's very cool. Um, what the Russians did is something slightly similar. Right? So the, the Russians actually just hire um, people to do stuff for them, because if they lack the internal capability, they simply hire from the broad uh, group of cyber criminals that they have in their country. So they have very, very deep expertise in their civilian population that they can farm work out to, and then they can just collect back from that. And it's absolutely genius. Um, these guys just have lots of money, right? So 
the Chinese were clever in how they went around doing it. Uh, the Russians are clever in that they use their civilian population, and these guys are clever in that they have been spending billions and billions of dollars for decades, which, you know, like, works out pretty well. So um, they're very, very rich, and they've spent all of their money on tooling, and that turns out to be very, very important because it's actually a lot easier to get very, very good tools from a few skilled people and then a whole bunch of idiots to operate it than just to find really, really skilled people. Uh, which I'll be getting to in a minute. Um, the, the one interesting story I want to tell you about is how NSA managed to take over computer hacking. Because early on, computer hacking was actually done by CIA. And what happened was, in the 90s, when people stopped using radio as much and they started switching over to computers, there's a, a huge tension in the US between whether computers were going to be the CIA's role or the NSA's role. So the CIA, basically, they steal secrets. The secrets are on a computer, they should get to steal them as well. Right? So this was actually just a budget fight. It wasn't about anything else, it was about budget. And so NSA invented the idea of signals intelligence at rest. So signals intelligence, SIGINT, is radio. Right? That's what NSA did, is they listened to radios. And then they invented the idea that before a radio signal gets sent, it can live on a computer. So if they hack the computer, it's basically the same thing as listening to radio. So they invented this genius way of interpreting um, their mandate to switch over and take over computer hacking. Right. Uh, and sorry, the important thing to remember is um, these guys, Lubyanka, the KGB, the first thing we know about them doing computer hacking is from uh, 1989. And these guys, the first thing we know about is from 1988, with the Mars worm. So, Keep that in mind, because these guys getting into the cyber game was inevitable, right? Like the the cybersecurity as we knew it was always going to end up as an area where nation states were playing. There was just no way of avoiding that, um, and that's because information wants to be freed, right? Basically, these guys want to steal your data always. That's their job, that's what they do. And as long as you have data, someone needs to steal it. Right? And for a long time, the internet just wasn't big enough, like it wasn't interesting enough, and now that it is, it was inevitable that we were going to brush up against them. So, uh, if you remember, right, so I mentioned the, the KGB was doing computer hacking in 89, and NSA was in 88, that we know publicly. So that was before any of us were involved in computers. Right? Like, there's just obviously no way that we could last this long without them getting involved. So this is the new normal. Right? From now on, there's going to be targeted attacks by people that are bigger and better and stronger than you. Like, that's it. So like, we're kind of here. We're kind of stuck. Like, now what? How, how do you live with the fact that there's always going to be people who are going to be better than you? Well, I have some answers. Um, most of them are like, you're kind of stuffed. But before I get into that, I want to talk about the, the strategies and tactics that we get to see developing. Because I think that that is actually more interesting than um, like the, the technologies that get used. It's the, the broader approach. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what's being called cyber war, even though it's not actually a war. It's a conflict that's happening on computers and in networks. Right. So cyber war does not look like this. This is what it was supposed to look like. Right? When we used to think about cyber war, our ideas was that there'd be really, really skilled people, <clears throat> us, and that we would like fight each other and we'd use like these, these highly skilled and like really clever techniques and we'd dress cool and we'd listen to like awesome music and it would be very, very exciting and everyone would realize how amazing and clever we were. Right? That, that was the, the theory. And in reality, it kind of sucks. <laughs> like, it's people in uniform sitting at computers for eight hours or 12 hours a day going clicky clicky. Right? Like, there's nothing actually exciting about cyber war. And that really sucks. Like, it was supposed to be cool, but 
And I think what's more interesting isn't that the reality has turned out to be different from the fantasy. It's that um, why did everyone who had so long to learn how computers worked and conflict worked and has had so much experience with conflict, like we've had several millennia of recorded history of people fighting each other. Like we should have been able to figure out that it's not actually like nation states don't actually decide their fate based on individual duels of skill. Like, like that doesn't happen. It's basically uh, the people who can organize that win. So how come everyone got it so wrong? And it turns out one of the problems is that we're not very good at reasoning about new domains. So a new domain of conflict is very, very rare. We basically went through uh, 100,000 years of only having two domains of conflict, which was land and sea. And in the last 100 years, we've added three new ones, which is air, space, and cyber. So uh, these are the five domains of conflict, land, sea, air, space, cyber. Air is very interesting because air, there's actually been active conflict and you can see what's happened. Space is not interesting because no one actually fights there. And cyber is even more interesting because right now you can actually see how people are learning to combat and, and engage in conflict in cyber. So you can see what is developing. And I think it's very, very exciting. So, it's very, very infrequent that we come up with new domains of conflict. They're very, very hard to predict because um, the technology tends to be very, very critical and without understanding all the technology as it evolves, we tend to get things wrong. And the only way you can actually learn is at the, the intersection of theory and practice. So you, you end up with your theory early on and then when people actually go out and try and do stuff, you see how wrong the theory was. And this actually happened to us before when we did air war. Right? So when we invented the air domain of conflict, we learned a huge amount about the original theory of how uh, air conflict was supposed to work out and the actual practice. So if we look at air power in 1915, there were an idea of conflict that actually mirrored our original idea of cyber war. Right? The problem, the problem was that the technology wasn't up to it, and I think that that's what we would have seen in the, the 80s and 90s, the technology just wasn't there. But early on, airplanes were basically motorized kites. Right? They're, they're big flat pieces of cloth with a propeller at one end that could sort of get up in the air and stay there for a bit and then come back down, and that was about it. Uh, they didn't have a way of shooting forwards through the propeller arc, um, so there was not really a lot that you could do to, to engage in active conflict. Um, so they were primarily used for a reconnaissance role. Right? They, they provided the visibility that allowed artillery to uh, target enemy locations. And it was absolutely vital for that. And that's something we see with cyber as well. The, the primary use case for cyber is still espionage. It's used as a reconnaissance tool to enable other domains of conflict. So uh, I think there's, there's very, very strong parallels between the early air war and the way that cyber has played out. So what they believe in this, this early part of the war is that the way that air conflict would play out would be based on very, very highly skilled pilots um, in highly, highly maneuverable planes so that they could show off the maximum amount of their skill. And then they would, they would fight each other in these sort of one-on-one -on -one bouts of like high skill. And as a result, what they did was they built very, very highly maneuverable planes. Well, that's what they aimed to do. And it turned out that that was actually crap. Right. Um, what actually works isn't having the most highly skilled people, it's having the most people. And having the most people find the weakest people and jump all of them at once. Right. So in practice, when they developed the rules of war, uh, the Dicta Volca, the idea was that you would surprise people, and you'd surprise the weakest people, and you'd surprise the weakest people en masse, and cause the most amount of damage possible. And um, this actually turns out to work very, very well. Like the rules of war for air conflict that were developed in 1917 are the same rules that are used today for uh, visible fighting. Like if you're in an airplane today doing uh, a dogfight with the machine gun, you're using the exact same rules that were used 100 years ago. Right? Like it turns out that these are really, really 
powerful. Like this is how you actually do it. And the, the main takeaway was that if you want to win, you basically need to cheat. And the way that you cheat is you get like the big guys to beat up the little guys. Right. So um, this is the actual list of uh, war rules that he came up with. Um, and all of them are built on the idea of getting in a dominant position on someone very, very early on and staying there. And you'll see the strong parallels that that has with cyber, particularly when you look at client sides. So basically you attack from behind, you attack from above, you dive on them, and you shoot with as many people as possible to uh, the weakest things you can find. And that basically works very, very well in air because in air there's no defense, right? It's pretty much all offense. Like, and that, again, is very, very similar to cyber. Uh, cyber is almost purely offensive. There's very, very few defensive technologies we have that work. There's monitoring, there's firewalls, and everything else is offense. Um, and you'll see it's the same in air, right? There's a saying of that there's only two types of planes. There's fighters, which are planes that can attack, which for us would be uh, exploit frameworks. And there's targets, right? It's things that get shot down, which is basically all computers everywhere. And so if your technology advances to a given state, and your theory of how to engage in conflict advances as well, eventually you will reach a local maxima, which was basically the Red Baron, where you had a sufficiently maneuverable plane that was able to fire forwards to the propeller arc, and from there, he racked up like the most kills that have ever been racked up by a human being like, in, in air. So um, having, having the correct theory and the correct technology allows you to uh, basically reach the pinnacle of a particular domain of conflict. Um, one, of, one of the amusing things to note is that these triplanes uh, they're very, very highly maneuverable, but they were not particularly popular because when you were doing maneuvers, the top wing had a tendency to fall off in flight. And that was very disconcerting. So, um, the primary takeaways to get from this is that the way that you win in combat <coughs> is that you want to overwhelm the weak opponents and you want to take them by surprise. You want to do it very quickly before they can react or before anyone can come in to help them. You want to do it very hard because you want to win. So you want to hit them quickly and you want to hit them powerfully. And then you want to leave because you don't want to wait around for other people to show up. And that was basically the approach that won the air war, is having more people. And uh, I think that if you, if you view the uh, evolution of that domain of conflict, the, the early approach of looking at highly skilled individuals with uh, very, very high-end technology facing off to see who had superior skill versus what actually worked, which was having large amounts of uh, reasonably skilled people facing off against a small number of other people and hitting them by surprise when they weren't expecting it. Right? That actually has very, very strong parallels to how cyber conflict is playing out in that uh, even though we initially believed having highly skilled hackers was critical to having an effective uh, cyber component, it turns out that actually the only thing that's really important is having sufficiently good tools. Like if your technology is good enough, you can train up any monkey to clicky-clicky and own anyone. Right? And the, the point of that is being able to hit the right people. So. If we draw parallels from that to look at uh, tactical cyber, like what has actually been proven to work, right? So in, in this new domain of conflict, things that actually work. It turns out it's not this, right? It's not actually having awesomely skilled people. Uh, one of the quotes that um, a friend of mine is very familiar with the NSA uh, team is that, um, the amazing thing about Tau is not actually who they have doing it, but who they can actually have do it. So uh, his point was that 
the people who are actually staffing Tau are not especially skilled, but the technology is so good that the skill level isn't actually relevant. Right? Like you can train literally anyone to use the tooling that they have. All of the skill is actually in the tool development, not in the tool use. And that's very, very similar with any APT group that you look at, is the people actually engaged in uh, tool use are not necessarily very skillful. Right? Like it doesn't actually take huge amounts of skill to operate those tools. Developing those tools is more interesting. And that's where the skilled people tend to be, not actually at the pointy end. So um, that's, that's basically what we've gotten to. It's like we, we've now been involved in a conflict for long enough that we can actually see uh, some rules starting to emerge about how to win cyber domains of conflict. So uh, I will now show you a demo of how to win. You sneak up behind someone and you destroy them quickly. It's very, very easy. And uh, if, we, if we look at the specific technology involved in this, um, for example, the NSA is uh, sufficiently positioned on the global internet that they can do targeted attacks globally against uh, people's individual browsers and individual computers. Uh, you end up with quantum. So quantum is basically um, a tool for people who have access to 90% of all the traffic on the internet. Right? You can see everything that goes by, you can select one individual and you can target them. Uh, there's smaller versions of quantum, which are used at just the nation state level, like for example, Iran has their own ones that they use internally. Um, I understand that Saudi Arabia does as well. And these are ISP level uh, quantum style attacks where they can target one individual inside a country. Uh, NSA is uniquely privileged in being able to target one individual inside the internet. Um, and the, the reason that uh, this sort of attack works is, first of all, browsers are complete shit. Right? Like they're absolutely the, the worst, most horrible things you can have, and everyone has them, and uh, they're too complicated, and there's no way to secure them properly and they're just horrible in every way imaginable. Uh, they've, they've got media libraries from the 90s, they've got image libraries from the 90s, they've got sound libraries from the 90s. Like, there's nothing good happens in a browser. Um, but, uh, given that it's easy to develop an exploit for a browser, relatively speaking, and it's easy to target <coughs> one individual, because browsers do a huge amount that identifies a particular individual, and given that it always works, why wouldn't the NSA use it, right? Like they're, they're not trying to demonstrate that they're the best at developing a unique and clever exploit. They're trying to actually own someone and get on with the job, right? Uh, from the point of view of a nation state attacker, the attack is actually the least interesting part of the operation. It's something that they want to get out of the way so that they can move on to the actual collection, which is the point of the exercise, is to actually get to the information. Um, when you look at the Asia Pacific threat, the stuff that they do is similarly, it's targeted, it's easy, and it works. So they primarily go for spear phishing. Um, this is partially because they have invested a huge amount of time, money, and effort in developing that spear phishing tool chain. But it's also because they don't actually have access to internet backbones in the same way that the US does. Right? They're not as privileged to be able to do quantum level attacks against anyone. So uh, what they're forced to do instead is spear phishing attacks. And um, spear phishing attacks are very, very useful. Like the, the idea is basically that you email an exploit to someone and say, please run this exploit for me. And then they double click it and they run it and it works and you get your shell. And from there you can do your lateral, traver your, um, lateral traversal, you can move through the networks, you can find their stuff and you can collect on them. And uh, this mostly works because they go after people who uh, are very, very bad at computers, which is pretty much everyone. So um, spear phishing is amazingly successful, but that still uses exploits. Phishing by itself is also spectacularly successful. Right? So if you look at the, the nation state level attacks used by um, the smaller nation states that do not invest in exploit tooling, 
they still use phishing. And what they do is they just rename, uh, they'll, they'll have their malware encoder, like the, the malware installer, and they'll rename it to like document.exe. And they will email that to people and say, here's a special document, and people will fucking double click on it. And the reason that that works is uh, most people are very confused by computers, but also um, nation state intelligences, like the national intelligence services, one of their big things is recruitment. Right? They will assess an individual, they'll find their weaknesses, or um, basically their susceptibilities and their vulnerabilities, so things that they're interested in and things that they're scared of. And they will recruit that person, they will get that person to uh, you know, betray their nation or their friends or something. So nation states have, national uh, intelligence agencies have been doing this since forever, right? Like that's their bread and butter, that's what they do. When they move online, going from recruiting someone to uh, betray their company, to recruiting someone to just click on a link is very, very easy, right? It's in line with what they've been doing forever. So it's very, very simple for them to switch over to do phishing attacks, right? This is the, the core, like this is their DNA, that's what they do. And so what you end up seeing is that the things that have been developed by nation states for cyber are very, very lame attacks, but they're also very, very successful attacks. They go after client sites, uh, they do spear phishing, or they do regular phishing, and they hit browsers. That's, you know, probably 80% of all the APT attacks are based purely on this, the, these, these two techniques, are sending an email to someone or sending something to their browser. Um, you'll also see that there are more advanced techniques that get used against hardened targets. Uh, for example, the USB attacks that get used to penetrate uh, air gaps networks are used. Um, there's also stuff that happens against web apps to get access, uh, such as SQLI, that's less interesting um, at a nation state level. Typically, they're not particularly interested in getting onto a web app, except that they want to then use it as a platform to target people's browsers. <laughs> Uh, and then there's other stuff that you get to do if you own all of the internet or you own all of the companies that people buy their internet equipment from, uh, such as you can sniff Telnet across the entire internet, or uh, you can do interdiction of uh, hardware that's being shipped out. But, you know, what you'll see is that this is the long tail, like those, those sorts of things are the long tail of APT attacks. What actually happens is attacks against client-side stuff, and uh, that's mostly sending emails, and it's mostly browsers, so that's it. That's, that's fundamentally cyber, right? It's kind of boring. So those are the tactics that work, and you'll probably notice that they're very, very familiar to, to us now after we've looked at uh, air conflict. So they overwhelm the weak, they go in quickly, they hit hard, and then they get out. And one of the reasons that um, they, they want to target rapidly and then start exfiltrating and leave, although usually they don't leave, they, they stick around until they get caught, which is forever. Um, I think the, the average time for an APT on a network is something like 270 days, which is quite a long time, right? You can actually exfiltrate everything you want in 270 days. Um, I took out all of the slides about this, but there's actually some very, very interesting things that you could look at about uh, what's called the period of vulnerability. So um, in an operation, your exposure to vulnerability is actually just simply a function of time. Right? The, the more time that you have on target, the more likely you are to get in trouble. And the less time you have, the smaller your uh, period of vulnerability, the, your exposure goes down. So what you'll see is that um, some of the much more advanced APT stuff, which is done by the US, is stuff that has to be renewed every 30 days. Right? Like they have to get, it's done sort of legally, they have to get a new authorization every 30 days to continue to have access to a device. Otherwise, the Trojan that they've installed will self-delete. So they'll have implants that have to get uh, updated every 30 days. Otherwise, it removes itself. And that turns out to be very, very useful because it allows you to go in, to collect, and then to leave and have no evidence left behind. 
because that's very, very bad for you. Like, you don't want people to know that you've done collection on them, generally speaking. Um, but, you know, the, the Chinese and the Russians tend not to give a fuck. They basically just go in and they collect for as long as they can because they know that there are no repercussions for getting caught because the collection that they're doing is not uh, of a sensitive nature. Right? Like it's, it wouldn't be compromised by the knowledge that they're, they're doing that collection. Anyway, um, so yeah, getting out actually tends not to be done a huge amount in the cyber except by the much more advanced stuff, which is very sad. But uh, to talk about the operational use of cyber, which I think is also very interesting, is to, to understand the phases of an operation and how uh, operationally cyber gets used, which um, it gets used in a way which allows it to be successful repeatedly. Right? So you'd think that a small team with a million dollars versus a team of, you know, um, hundreds with billions of dollars at their disposal. Right? The, the, the billion dollar large team should win every time there's a conflict. Right? Like that's the way you should bet. But in cyber, what you find is that actually a small team with a million dollars can do a lot more than a large team with billions of dollars. And that's because the large teams with billions of dollars have very, very large organizations that they have to deal with. So um, like the reason that Google is penetrated successfully by China is not that China is smarter and has more advanced people than Google. Like they, they might, but that's not actually relevant. The reason it works is that, um, I'll get to that. But the, basically, the reason it works is that the Chinese can target one part of the Google organization and hit that specific one part. And when they go for that, they're almost guaranteed to win. And once they have one there, then they can move laterally and terminally to do other stuff. And unless Google can detect that, which is what they've invested huge amounts of money in, then the Chinese would win consistently. Um, and similarly for the Russians, the Russians also go after Google. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese go after Facebook, like pretty much everyone. But um, so the, the reason that small teams win against large teams is also something that has been uh, discovered in conflict analysis. And that's if you look at special operations, like special forces. Again, you'd think that a, a very small team versus an army, the small team would have no chance. But it turns out that special forces are actually extremely good at getting the job done. And that comes down to a, a basic theory of how to conduct special forces operations. And that theory has actually been organically redeveloped inside cyber operations. So um, the, the key elements to a successful special operation are simplicity, like the basic elements of that operation need to be very simple and very, very basic, uh, and there, there shouldn't be any complexity overall. The operation needs to be secret against the, um, the adversary. They can't know that it's going to happen. Uh, the core elements need to be based on repetition, so that allows the operators to uh, conduct their elements of the operation because they've done it over and over and over again. When they do it live, it's exactly like they've done in training. So they don't have to think about it. It's just uh, natural to them. Uh, it needs to be done with surprise. So the adversary cannot be ready and waiting. So it needs to be a basically a surprise attack. And again, the reason for this is uh, fairly straightforward and obvious. If you take the enemy by surprise, you have a natural advantage. Uh, it needs to be done very rapidly. Right? The, the longer you stay involved in an operation, the more likely it is to collapse. And this is because the longer someone has to respond to something, uh, the, more the more resources they can devote to addressing it. And again, uh, you'll see in cyber, like basically if you're on a network for too long, then when you get discovered, all of your stuff will be cleaned up and you'll have a hard time having access again. Uh, you see this sort of thing starts to happen with a lot of ABTs that spend too long using the same tool chains. Um, those tool chains end up being uh, heavily analyzed and going into detection software and then they have to switch the tool chains that they use, which is expensive and annoying. But um, actually the, the primary thing that sets a special operation apart from 
uh, normal operations is that it's conducted with purpose. Right? Like they're not out there shooting guns to shoot guns. They're out there conducting a mission with purpose. As everyone involved knows what the mission objectives are and they're engaged in achieving those mission objectives. And you'll see that's the same thing with cyber. Right? Like people who are just out there hacking because they want to hack don't really accomplish all that much. Right? Unless they uh, choose a specific target. So you'll see that this, this is what happens with anonymous and the hacktivists is that their skill level is not particularly high. And so they, they cannot actually choose their targets at will. They have to find a target that they can hack and then uh, reverse engineer a reason for having attacked that target. Right? And that's because their, their purpose doesn't actually matter to them. Right? It's not the central thing that's driving them. Otherwise, they would spend forever on one target. They would be persistent, but they're not. Um, you will see that with APT groups, with, with actual cyber, they have a mission, right? The, the point of actually doing it all is to collect specific information. And that's why they actually tend to achieve that goal, is that the technology can catch up with them and they can actually ultimately achieve their goals because they are purposeful. They have a reason for being there. And that's why this is what cyber actually looks like. There's a bunch of people doing clicky-clicky stuff and in the background, there's someone telling them what to do. Right? Like, cyber is actually like this. Uh, the cool thing, that guy's using Kali. <laughs> the guy at the front. Um, so, uh, cyber operations are basically conducted with purpose, and they're conducted with speed, and they're against the weakest targets. But um, there's some other stuff to think about as well. Like one of the problems that APT groups have is that they're organizations. And the problems with organizations is that you have a boss, and you have a budget, and you have missions, and you have constraints, and you have vacation time, and you have uh, internal politics, and you have all the other problems that show up with you know, an actual organization. So there's limitations to what they can do. And it doesn't matter if they're like the Chinese, like, or the Russians, or the Indians, like all the North Koreans, right? Like everyone has the same problems. You always have to deal with the fact that like you have only so much resources and only so much money you can invest in something. You always have the basic problems that uh, your boss has some ideas and like the people who are involved have certain skill sets that may or may not actually match up with the mission objectives. Um, you also have the problem that you've invested in a tool chain. And tool chains are huge investments. Right? Like they cost millions and millions of dollars for these organizations to develop a specific set of tools that they're going to then use. And once you have made that investment, doing a switch is very difficult and very expensive. Right? If you train 500 people in how to send phishing emails and how to use a specific rat or a specific implant, Retraining all of them to do something else actually takes a lot of time. Right? It's not just simply a matter of writing a new implant. You have to retrain all of your people to use it, and it's going to be uh, very slow, which is why you see people using tool chains inappropriately. Right? Like, they've made a commitment. they bought the fucking tractor. It doesn't matter what they're going to do. They're going to use the fucking tractor. Right? Like, this is it. They, they are invested and they're committed. So you'll see, for example, um, the Russian APT, the Duke groups, are now using something like nine different strains of malware simultaneously. Right? And no one wants to use nine different strains of malware, but they've made those commitments and they're stuck with it. And it's very, very expensive for them to switch back out and to do something differently. So, like, and, and this comes down to resource investments. They, they can't put the money in and they can't fix it. So, <clears throat> Those are all of the tactical things that come up. So it's, it's basically uh, overwhelming the weak, hitting them very hard, um, using your organization with purpose, uh, having your people do the same thing over and over again so they get very good at it. You know, um, consistently, this is what we're trying to find is the effective way of conducting cyber. And that's why our job now is getting kind of weird in that uh, we started out dealing with only 
script kiddies, and now instead we're dealing with nation states, and they're very, very good at it, even though their tools and techniques are very, very lame. Um, and I wanted to talk briefly about strategically where cyber fits in. But it turns out I actually can't, and that's because no one has any clue where cyber actually fits in at a strategic level. So uh, this is a quote from a two-star general in the Cyber Command in the US. <clears throat> Data packets are like bullets, and your walls of fire are like the armor that repels them. Okay, so he has no fucking clue what he's talking about. <laughs> Not at all. That's why he's a two-star? That's why he's a two-star general. <laughs> right. So no one actually really knows how cyber fits in. We know that it's useful for espionage, but beyond that, it's a little bit confusing. And so I wanted to bring up um, a book written in 1921 called Command of the Air. And this is the first paragraph of that book. And the amazing thing is that every time he says aeronautics or air, you say the word cyber, it is completely relevant, right? So cyber has opened up to men a new field of action, the field of cyber, right? Like it's completely amazing, right? Uh, blah, 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 right? The, pra the practical use of the cyber was at first only vaguely understood, okay? Uh, cyber has sprung suddenly into the field of war, like on and on consistently. This guy was the first one to talk strategically about the use of air power. And I think a lot of the same thought processes that he went through can be applied to cyber. Like he, he was trying to figure out how something that he had just seen used for real the first time was going to be used by nation states. And it's absolutely amazing. So I highly recommend that you read the book. Um, right, I, so I, I don't have much to say about the, the strategic level of cyber, and as I said, it's because I don't think anyone does. At the tactical level, we know exactly where we stand, uh, which is that you need to protect the, the weakest elements of your network, or you need to protect your network against those weakest elements. So you're kind of stuffed, right? You've got nation states out there that are stalking you, and there's not a whole lot you can do. So your job sucks. And what you probably have is money to throw at it, if you're lucky. So if you go to security vendors, you're going to be disappointed, because it's not actually a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> I, like Security vendors can't actually help you, because none of the tools and solutions that they have are capable of dealing with the KGB. I, like Fundamentally, that's just the way of the world. You can't actually beat the KGB at their own game. And if you go to conferences and you look at people who are like showing you really clever hacks that they've come up with, like stunt hacking, that's not actually going to help you. Like it looks cool, but it has no relevance to your job or what you're engaged in day to day. And if you look at the rest of the industry, it's mostly full of people making fun of you for getting hacked. Right? Like everyone loves to talk about like, oh, there's a breach that happened. Right? That's fucking tourism. Like, it's disaster tourism. There's people out there taking selfies while your fucking company burns. Right? And you can't hire your way out of it because you're going to get CIA SSPs. <laughs> no? Yeah? And, like, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And if you look at your nation state, like, is your nation, like, is your intelligence service that's engaged in all this, like, are they going to help you? Like, no, because they don't love you. Right? They don't give a fuck about you either. They've got other things to deal with, like other nation state intelligence services. Like, their goals are actually fighting each other. Right? So these dudes can't help you. And I can save you about $250,000 a year for threat intelligence. It was China. Right. So threat intelligence basically boils down to, it's, it's a very, very expensive version of antivirus. Um, they just say, like, I've seen one of these before, the last time I saw it, it was China, it's China this time. That's, that's basically what you get. So threat intelligence is not going to save you. You're basically stuffed. Like, none of that stuff actually works. But I will tell you what works. Okay. First of all, early detection. So, uh, 
as you as you remember, I said that speed was one of the critical components of an effective cyber operation is they need to get in and they need to get out. But it's also very, very hard for them to do that because they need to learn your network. Right? They're basically a new hire without access to any of the new hire tools. So they, they have to spend all of their time figuring out where everything is. And that phase makes them extremely vulnerable. So if you have a sort of uh, a canary in the coal mine, someone you're easily detecting that there's someone new on your network and that they're probing around, you have a very, very high chance of detecting APT attacks. Like nation states are not magic. They also have to figure out how things work. So early detection. Okay, um, French people know what this is. This is what your network is supposed to look like. like. You've got your firewalls, you've got like your important stuff in the middle, like no one can get access. Like in theory, this is how it, it's supposed to look, right? In practice, it probably looks like this. You really hope no one sneezes, because that shit's going to fall over. Right? So because you cannot, you cannot actually implement one of these, and you're kind of stuck with this, you want to aim for that. You want to go for containment and compartmentation. You want to make uh, the important data in segregated environments that's difficult to get to for people who are not authorized. And the reason that you want to limit access to that data is primarily because when you do get compromised, which if you're doing anything interesting is bound to happen, uh, what you want to do is you want to limit the scope of that breach. You want to, to do uh, impact containment. You want to reduce the amount of information that gets lost. You want to use your early detection systems to figure out that it has been breached, that you can do a cleanup rapidly and you can do rapid response. And uh, you want to limit the amount of information that's available from any one particular breach. Right? That's basically what you're aiming at. So uh, early detection, compartmentation, um, anything with a bank vault, right? you probably think that the security of a bank vault comes from like this big fuck off door, but that's actually not correct. The reason that banks are secure is because of this. Right? Inside that vault, there's hundreds and hundreds of smaller little vaults, and that comes down to, again, it's speed, it's time. So uh, for a bank robber, right, banks know that when they get robbed, you can't actually stop. Like, a guy shows up with a gun and says, give me the money, you give him the money. Right? You cannot stop the man with the, the gun. It's similar with an APT. When they show up, you can't actually stop them. They can outspend you at any particular point. They're bound to win. The trick is to limit the amount that they can do, the amount of damage that they can do with that particular win. So the way it works with a bank robber is uh, they only have about two minutes that they can spend inside of a bank before they start looking at the early arrival of the police. Right? So if you assume that from the time you pull out a gun until um, from the time you pull out a gun, someone will sound the alarm. From the alarm sounding until the first responder, that's approximately two minutes. So for a bank robber, they know they've got a time window of two minutes on site. And in two minutes, you can't do shit in here, right? You can empty out all the drawers out front with all the cash, but you can't do anything in here. So that's how banks basically defeat bank robbers, is they just make it very, very slow and expensive. You have to do the same thing, so you have to compartment and make it slow and time consuming, and then use that early detection so that you can respond rapidly before they get everywhere. And that will allow you to beat the A-team, right? Even the A-team can get busted if they're too slow. But other than that, I recommend that you sit back and enjoy, because war can be kind of beautiful. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions? Uh,